bringing the people behind our food to life. Part of seed saving is completing cycles. When I first started, I realized, huh, you, every plant we grow, we save the seeds. It didn't even occur to me not to do it. And then it, well, that's how come I got into, this, uh, into uh, seed saving. I was standing at the sink in Jacksonville, cleaning a winter squash we'd grown in the backyard. And you know, and so I, you cut it in half, and then you take a spoon and you scoop out the, cell, the seeds, right? And you throw them in the compost. And you take the squash, you put it in the oven, you bake it, and you eat it. Fabulous, delicious. My parents never grew Maximus. They didn't even know about them. Here's a species of squash that comes from Peru and Bolivia, that is, when you get the right cultivars and you just bake them and eat them, it's like heavenly food. It's so delicious. You don't eat anything. We all grew up adulterating our food. Everybody put more sugar on it, more salt, more crap on the food we got, and most of us grew up eating meat. I grew up eating meat, 10 kinds of meat, 12 kinds of different developments of meat, one kind of dead thing, Rick, another kind of dead thing. Would, I didn't want to eat this stuff anymore. I didn't want to kill the animal. I realized I used to be a good fisherman. I used to go fishing all the time and love to catch fish, and I would fillet them and eat them and cook them. I didn't want to do it anymore. I realized I got high, and I realized, what am I murdering this critter for? I can eat lettuce and just eat a leaf, and I don't kill the plant. I can pick a bean and I can eat it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to eat the seeds. I start to get involved in how much killing I do all the time to live. Can I change the balance in my life about harmlessness? Can I change it from such a violent thing all the time to something that is more sustainable, more benevolent, makes more sense? So I, I eat an apple. You can grow the seeds and you can eat the fruit. You don't kill anything. It's a nonviolent uh, food stuff. That there was alternatives that I never considered would be interesting or relevant or even uh, available until these later years of gardening and considering the issues about those things. And, oh, so I was at the sink and I was throwing away the seeds of the winter squash and I realized I've been working in a field pulling gladiolus in March. Get up, it's frozen. You work for $1.92 an hour. You come back beat, cold, and you're, you're throwing the seeds in the, comp in the compost of a pack that's going to cost you two dollars to buy a pack of these seeds next spring. And I realized, you are nuts. Is something wrong with your brain? How come you didn't save the seeds? And I started saving the seeds. Right? It just all of a sudden it went off that I realized the connection of completing the cycle and what it meant. So we started saving the seeds and we formed the first seed company, then the second seed company, and laid the seeds a change. And, and now my kids have a seed company. And so it's, we have become custodians. Uh, and so, so that was completing that, what made the link of completing the cycle that most gardeners don't save their seeds. I, I, got, I went through this thing, I would go around saying, you know, lettuce is a daisy. People said, lettuce is a daisy? I had no idea, I never saw a lettuce flower. Right, little yellow flowers, I never saw it, right? It, you realize, divide and conquer. That the society's mind has been divided and conquered in so many ways that we frequently don't have that freedom to associate what really goes together and makes sense because we are so pulled out of the biological context that we are part of. Uh, then one day I asked the seed company uh, about their uh, pea they were offering and I wanted to grow it organically and I wanted to be able to sell the seeds in our little seed company. And they said, no, we own it, rights on that and you can't, we won't grow it organically and you can't do it. So I said, oh, I can't do that, but I can use it as a parent to breed something because at that time you could, as a plant breeder, you could just take germplasm and use it. There were no license agreements or anything. So I said, okay, and so we made some new kinds of peas that were different from the original one. And it took us 15, 10, 15 years, and then we had a pea that we didn't have to worry about it. We could grow it organically, and we wanted it for everybody to have good health. So we. So that was like a, a, a particular experience that uh, pushed me in the direction of being interested in public domain plant breeding. I retired as research director of Seeds of Change and rejuvenated Pea Seeds, which is the family seed company that started the whole thing. And uh, we're, we're now back at, at, in Corvallis in Brown's Garden, we call this, which is three and a half acres. So we moved to Corvallis and we were doing pea seeds. I was also doing seeds of change. So I dropped seeds of change. I dropped pea seeds and I worked seeds of change when I was here for a bunch of years. And so uh, in 97, I was still working as research director of seeds of change. So we had the notion that why don't we make some gardens, since I've been studying the world flora and when you figure out uh, how many daisies and how many solanums and how many uh, kinds of potatoes and how many, you realize 
I have no idea about this stuff. Let's make a garden where we take eggplants are related to tobacco, are related to petunia, are related to salpiglossus, are related to physalis, are related to uh, solanum, big genus, and capsicum. And so we collected all the different kinds of solanums and all the genera and made a garden out of it. We did it with corn, that's the grasses, and all the rel relatives of, of that. And we did, so kinship gardens we call them, that we grow the relatives in the related to one another so we could take a look at what it is that people who study botany and talk about could actually, what are they talking about, right? Let's make a garden out of it. So we did that. We did 10 of those, umbels, the carrots, coriander, cilantro, parsley, uh, and they're related to the umbels, uh, the, to the uh, to ginseng. And, 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 and so all of a sudden I thought, and they're related to daisies. Oh, and that's related to the borages, are related to the solanums, and the morning glories are related to them also, and, uh, and the pulmoniaceae. And all of a sudden I started to wander around and I could see, oh, this is what's going on, is the fabric of how life pieces are related to one another. So I knew what the resource base is to develop what we're now doing, which is public domain plant breeding. I understood in that years, 20 years of studying and growing and, and growing as much as possible, saving the seeds, getting hands-on experience, cleaning the seeds, growing it again, looking for crosses, watching what happens when you get crosses, watching what adaptation of cultivars, growing hundreds and hundreds of heirlooms of all the different crops. I began to get an, uh, a notion about stuff. It's not verbal, it's experiential. And so now, after 20, 25 years of, of, of preparatory plant breeding, I begin to understand that the public domain is the resource, is the, can hold the treasures for subsequent generations. And if one can develop genetic combinations of sufficient subtlety, use, and originality, and put it in the public domain, I can actually, can, rather than owning it, patenting and limiting it, I can help open it up to make it possible that anybody who wants to get into something profound and interesting can do it for virtually nothing.